Um, the um, only thing uh, that I remember to say about the lab, I don't know if I'll remember later, is that when you do lab practice and when you analyze results, we always get something. We always get numbers. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, from a machine, from interpreting them and looking that they're um, reliable is, um, is another thing that we haven't uh, done here, but it's something to remember, okay? Because you always get something out of these uh, um, experiments and just to see that it's reliable. So, um, solid. Um, <coughs> so, uh, so the, 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 the first thing, as we said, we want to, uh, we, we said it's an important issue and we want to first take it out from the system and then treat it, and that's what we're gonna uh, talk about. So, um, uh, in terms of removing it by sedimentation, uh, the most important thing is uh, um, basically it's these settling properties that we just looked at, and um, and uh, the specific gravity which determines whether uh, the particle is gonna float or gonna uh, settle. And we'll say a few words about that shortly. Um, the particle size distribution, whether it's a large diameter or a smaller diameter. And um, just by experience, we already know, um, done by several groups, that uh, uh, many, I mean, it depends what you, you, how, how you operate your system, but uh, after removing the uh, very uh, small, uh, I mean, the, 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 the fraction of uh, easily settling, settleable solids, which is above 100 micrometer, the, the rest, the majority of the rest um, is less than 30 micrometer, which is uh, harder to remove, and it would take some drum filtration, some sort of mechanical filtration, okay? So um, if you want to remove this smaller fraction, then, then it ha more uh, needs to be done than just settlement um, or sedimentation, but not necessarily not always one have to take it out. It really depends on the, um, on the, on the situation. Um, <clears throat> so the removal mechanisms, uh, gravity separation, filtration, flotation, there are quite uh, a few uh, methods. Um, and, and these are the, um, let's leave that because we're gonna really focus on um, sedimentation in this, uh, in this workshop and, and not so much uh, at the rest of the mechanisms, but they're important and they're used in aquaculture and, and they can be um, uh, something to, to think about when you're designing. And so the purpose to, to remove these suspended solids, uh, there are some uh, um, uh, methods that are coming from the wastewater treatment, but they're not so much used in aquaculture, very little. Um, so um, uh, just again, wanted to, uh, so you have it with your slides, but don't want to uh, talk about it too much. Um, in terms of, uh, again, technicalities, when we are talking suspended and soluble and so on, I just want, uh, again, for, for, for the formalities to uh, uh, demonstrate the different um, size groups and make you aware that uh, it sometimes we deviate from that. So any suspended particle would be above one micron or 0.7 micron, yeah, all the uh, way up. The removable, um, the, the um, colloidal bit would be underneath one micron or 0.7 all the way to uh, the micrometer, 10 to the minus three, um, okay, micrometer. And then uh, the dissolve will be the nano uh, bit, which is um, uh, considered dissolved, the 10 to the minus nine. Now, uh, we consider the colloidal bit also as dissolved, okay? Um, that's what we filtered for. So just be aware that different people um, uh, divide the, uh, the, 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 the particles, the solids, a bit differently than what we just did. <clears throat> um, 
In terms of uh, remov removing, um, removal methods, again, this is a neat graph coming from Ebling uh, <coughs> and on Rust book. And, um, but basically what uh, it says, this is the uh, particle size in micrometers. It can tell you that anything that above micrometer usually would sediment quite well, sometimes to about uh, 80 micrometers and sometimes even more. But I mean, generally, 100 micrometer is a, is a good uh, uh, size for, for settling. Okay. Below that, it's uh, micro screens like these, car I mean, these drum filters or granular filters that goes usually all the way to about 30 micrometers. Some would uh, get to uh, even better, 15 micrometer. You see granular filters. And then uh, what we consider the more dissolved foam uh, uh, fraction, uh, you'd need foam fractionation and you can remove proteins and very small particles by flotation or other mechanism like um, desalination um, uh, membranes, like microfilters, um, nanofilters. Yeah, my, uh, um, so, so that's the thing. So sedimentation is the larger particles. And as I said, it's the easiest way to go. And then granular filter would do a good job. And then foam fractionation. So these three are often used in aquaculture, in intensive aquaculture. This and granular filter or media filter in general, and then plain sedimentation. Okay, but we today are going to talk only about sedimentation. So um, <coughs> sedimentation or settling, there are about four uh, mechanisms. Um, you know, the discrete where particles doesn't change its properties and, and not disturbing one another. Flocculation, when you add usually uh, coagulants or sometimes it uh, naturally happens where particle attached to another particle and create a larger uh, sweep flock, a larger particle, and then it settles. Or layered, or when it's compressed, you see it in the, uh, now when we have, um, when, when we are uh, doing this uh, settling test, you'd see that it starts and then it compressed over time. And um, um, OK. <clears throat> now, when we are looking at um, settling, then uh, uh, let, let's move forward. <laughs> when we're looking at settling, at sedimentation, and that's a uh, uh, important, and I don't want to go over these equations. Uh, um, it's not that important, and I'll try to be uh, quick, specifically at this time of the day, but uh, really a particle will settle um, only if, uh, you know, it's a balance of forces. So if the gravity force or the settling force is larger than the other forces that uh, it uh, produces. So these there is a gravity, there is a drag force, and there is a buoyancy, okay, that pushes, him, pushes it up. So um, the delta force, yeah, the, the, the sigma, I'm sorry, the uh, overall force is, uh, is dependent on the gravity, on the buoyancy, on the drag, normally. I mean, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, let's, and we leave it like that. So um, the driving force really is the uh, gravity and the buoyancy, the balance between the two, which is uh, related to the density of the particle and the density of the water, the gravity, which is uh, the gravity force, and the, um, and the volume of the particle, yeah? because that's what creates the buoyancy. So uh, that's, what, uh, that's the balance. The drag force is dependent on some coefficient, but on the uh, density of the liquid that it's uh, going through. Sorry? Um, the uh, the uh, cross-sectional area of the particle, yeah? And the settling velocity, which is a term that we'll use um, uh, shortly. And the drug coefficient itself is something to do with the flow, with the Reynolds number, but let's um, 
again, leave, leave that. So it's all what I want to say here, that it's all a balance of forces that whether uh, a particle will settle or will not settle. And um, basically, uh, a guy named Stokes uh, uh, um, tried to define it in a steady state uh, uh, situation and in a, in a laminar floor flow, which is the situation that we have in aquaculture, yeah? when we don't have turbulent flow. So this bit, would, we would not look at it at all. Uh, we'll only look at the um, lower Raynaud numbers where, where laminar flow is um, observed. And what you see that the velocity, the settling velocity is, again, dependent on gravity, the particle, I mean, the density of the particle and the density of the water, the shape of the particle, and this scale, the diameter, the viscosity of the liquid that we're, if it's water or oil, or I don't know, water with surfactants, okay? So that would affect the uh, settling velocity of the particle. So these are the governing mechanisms and they are important um, to, to determine these um, uh, velocity, I mean, settling velocity. And why is it um, important? Because when we design uh, when we design a settling basin, so we take, um, I don't know, like a, here, a pond, and just uh, think that it's all porous here, and all porous here, and you introduce uh, water into it, and you want to uh, yeah, pick up your, your, your particles in, in the bottom, whatever is not settled on the bottom just goes out. Maybe, actually, I think, yeah, I put, forgot, just one sec. Let's see if I have, uh, if there is internet, it's uh, really clean. And it um, really dependent on the horizontal velocity of the particle and the settling velocity of the particle. And then and we just show, saw the, um, the parameters that are affecting that, where the velo ve um, velocity of the horizontal velocity is, de is determined by the water flow into the system. Okay? So, yeah, this is a, a basin, a, a, a rectangular basin, porous, porous, and that's the base. So whatever sits here settles, whatever goes out is, um, is going into the water. Now, let's see. Cannot download information you requested. Let's, let's try that once more. But basically it shows that, that the water flow, so yeah, if the, if the flow is a bit uh, faster than it will take some more distance for the, uh, to, for, for the, for the particle to um, settle down, okay? Now, for each of these, uh, it's not coming. So each of these, um, um, but, but you can look at it later on if you uh, wanted, uh, that's the, uh, um, but if you uh, want to have, if, 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 if a particle gets in here and get, <coughs> is removed by the uh, system here, then that would be the, the its settling velocity would be the critical settling velocity. Yeah? It would be the, uh, the settling velocity that would, uh, um, that would be uh, the, one, the, 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 um, the one that will determine whether it goes, stays in or goes out, yeah? if it goes through all that. So that would be the critical settling velocity above this settling velocity the particle will be removed, and if the settling velocity will be slower than that, it will be, it will go out. Okay? So this is another, uh, um, Sorry. yeah? The, um, that is uh, horizontal velocity, it's considered a constant? No, it's the flow, yeah, it's constant here, but it's the flow, it's the, 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 the flow velocity, the water, the velocity of the water. It's considered constant because this is all uh, porous, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's one cross section is open here. Yeah, if you have a, a fully flow and everything is coming out at, this, at the height. Yeah. Okay, so horizontal velocity, settling velocity, and critical settling velocity. Okay. Now, I'm trying to insist uh, and, and talk about that in a little bit more details because 
Uh, there are some few features when you design or think about these things that are very important here. What we um, look that for um, the critical particle yeah, that would be removed, the length, what, what would determine whether it be removed or not? It would be the, um, the velocity, the horizontal velocity, and the length of the sedimentation point. And that would be um, yeah, proportional to the height and to the critical settling velocity. Okay, so that's what it says here, that the length over the, ver the horizontal velocity are proportional to the height and the settling, the critical settling velocity. So obviously the longer there is, it, it will stay. If it be shorter, then it would go out and, and so on. Okay? So if we continue to develop this idea, then the critical settling velocity, yeah, we just change that, is VH times H divided by the height divided by the length of the settling basin. If we move forward and we now consider the velocity, yeah, what's velocity? Well, we, we, we talked about that earlier in the, um, uh, when we talked about the mass balances there. Um, it's V over Q, I mean, sorry, Q over V, over velocity. So um, we, we, we can, we can, um, sorry, we can, um, let me write it on the board. Q, the flux is, right, is volume. The flux is volume in meter cubic per time, right? Now, the, um, so we have the V here and the, um, and the, uh, um, and the velocity is by the here the cross-sectional area, which is the width times the length. It's the width times the uh, I'm sorry, times the length. Yeah, the cross-sectional area of the basin. So if we divide the Q times the cross, I mean over the cross-sectional uh, the cross-sectional area. Yeah, B times H, B times, I'm um, sorry, B times height, yeah, cross-sectional area of this, uh, of this wall, yeah. We get uh, the, uh, again, critical settling velocity. So we can change the velocity, the horizontal velocity to the flux over the cross-section area, okay. And now when we do that, what we see is that if we, uh, the H, the heights are eliminated, it's a bit hard to see like that, but uh, uh, the, the heights are eliminated, and you end up that the critical settling velocity is <coughs> equal to the flux that gets in and the cross-sectional area, B and length, yeah, the, 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 the area of the basin. So, so really, it's the flux, over an area. And why it's important? Because the height of the settling basin is not important. And that's the point I wanted to make. So sedimentation is, is dependent on the, the flux and the uh, area of your basin, which is called also hydraulic load, okay? But not the height of the basin. So basically, it can be fairly shallow. And it's intuitively, it's, it's, it's very hard to grasp, OK? Now, if the velocity is, um, of the, the particle yeah, is greater than this hydraulic load, then it will be fully removed because it will settle quickly, then it goes out. If the velocity is smaller, the, the settling velocity is smaller, then this hydraulic load, it's only partially removed because some will go out from this system. Okay, and that's, that's the, um, 
important bit to remember from all these um, um, slides. Now, um, now when we know that, we can uh, start and um, discuss or, or calculate the removal, the removal rates. How much will be removed? So obviously, a particle that starts here will be removed a bit differently than a particle that starts here because it has longer, I mean, different distances to, uh, and heights to, to pass. So um, it's the, um, <coughs> if, if we are looking at the ratio yeah, or the, the height that the particle starts as a, as a ratio from the overall height, yeah, it really equals to the, um, to the, to the uh, settling velocity over the, um, of the hydraulic load. Okay? And therefore, we can uh, get and, and say that the removal rate is dependent just on that, on the critical settling, I mean, not the critical, the settling velocity of a particle over this hydraulic load. So um, it's the yeah, velocity that it settles and the hydraulic load, which is the uh, horizontal flow or the flow into the system over the cross-sectional area. And that's something that um, uh, uh, can tell you when you design this system um, how much will be removed and which particle will be removed. Okay, and that's where I want to give like uh, a quick example. But again, there is no impact to the depth. So um, if we want the, um, if we know our total suspended solids, just what we measure, that get into this settling, we can, um, <coughs> we can calculate how much will be removed. Yeah, so if uh, uh, the TSS concentration, that's CE, the concentration of TSS at the, efflu at the effluent, what's coming out, equals to whatever gets in times uh, the fraction that is removed. <coughs> I mean, sorry, that is uh, um, not removed. Yeah, one minus whatever removed comes out. That's easy to, uh, in it's intuitive, where the mass uh, of that is uh, basically like we did earlier, you know, it's the, uh, we just need to determine how much water is moving over time in, in, in a certain unit of time. So if we know what the concentration of TSS that is getting in, we know the, how much is removed, and we know how much water in a per unit is flowing, then we have the mass of particles uh, times the percent removal and we get the overall mass that, um, uh, that is coming out, that is not removed really, okay? And then we can again figure out what will be removed and what not. So let's um, try to simplify it with um, an example. So um, let's say that uh, water contains four sand fractions. You know, we just took the sludge and it has, we, we sieved it through different um, sieves and we know what's the uh, size fraction so um, um, some uh, have you know the, the, the yeah it have four size I mean four fraction of particle size the first fraction is uh, settles and we can calculate that again we can measure it yeah, settles at uh, 10 to the minus 1 centimeter per second the second fraction at 5 to the 10 time 10 to the minus 2 uh, centimeter per second that's how fast it goes down, and, uh, and this is the relative uh, proportion. So we have 10% of this fraction, and 20% of this fraction, and 50 of this, and then 20 of that, so it's overall 100, yeah? And, um, and we would like to remove 100% of fraction number two. And the question that we ask is, how, and, and we also know how much water we need to introduce into this uh, system. The question we ask is what would be, uh, how to design this, um, this, settling, um, this settling basin. I remind you that the removal rate yeah, equals to the settling velocity, here we have it, over the Q, here we have it, um, yeah, 
And we are asking what should be the size, the section, the area of this basin. Yeah? That's all we are asking here. And um, so the area equals to the flux times the removal rate over the uh, velocity, the settling velocity. This is just uh, changing, rearranging this equation here. And if you are asking, so again, Q is 10,000 square cubic meter per day. That's just conversion uh, to, to convert it to hours and seconds because here it's all about units. It's centimeter per second, yeah? And here we have 10 cubic meter per day, so we move it into seconds. Removal rate, that's a design criteria that we ask. We wanted 100% removal rate, okay? So we put 100% removal rate and... Um, <clears throat> um, and we know, the, we know the settling velocity, okay? Five times 10 to the minus two, there it is. Um, and now this is centimeter per second. We want it in meters, so we divide it by 100. And uh, we put in the calculator and we know that the size should be 230 square meter. And that's a design thing. So we didn't, um, so we know what we want and we design it accordingly and not guessing. That's, that's the, um, what I'm trying to uh, show. <clears throat> so, and then we can ask what is the removal ratio of each fraction, yeah? Well, we know this we already designed, it will be 100%. This is larger, so definitely it's gonna be 100% because it uh, settles faster. But these two we have no clue, okay, yet. So um, we just look what will be the removal rate and, um, uh, um, and we calculate that because you're, you, you see removal rate, we already established that would be equal to the, veloc the settling velocity over the critical settling velocity. So in this case, it'd be 20% um, uh, and in this case, it'd be 10%. Trust me, we, 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 we measured it. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and basically, so we know how much will be removed. So 100% from here, only 20% and only 10% from the lower fraction in this basin. Now, um, if we uh, had a known suspended, total suspended uh, solids concentration of 100 milligram per liter, we can actually identify how much is gonna stay in the basin and how much gonna get out. And when you calculate that uh, with, the, um, with the concentration, we end up that uh, it's 40 milligram per liter and 18 milligram doesn't matter. The concept it matters and you have it in your, in your, um, in your um, notes, okay? So um, how you um, calculate that, okay? So these are just setting basing the typical values um, that are used for uh, wastewater treatment and you can see that hydraulic load should range anywhere between one to 1.5 meter per hour. Um, the height, uh, that, that's very high, um, can be much uh, uh, smaller, but this is for, 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 um, uh, for, for large volumes. And the maximal settling basin area for uh, uh, one unit should not go above 300 square meter or just the less, but again, it's not, uh, in, in, in aquaponics, especially, especially in urban uh, uh, aquaponics, the, the sizes would be smaller. If you want a rural, uh, um, a rural um, the, uh, setup, then you may end up with, with these kind of dimensions. Okay? So um, that's uh, kind of uh, things to uh, remember and, and, and pay attention. And the idea is to design, not to guess. Again, that, that was the uh, aim of this, um, these few slides that are a bit technical. <coughs> um, questions or you're too shocked for uh, questions? Yeah, that's right. That but it's a, a but in the real thing. right. But usually, it's actually 
you, often it would be uh, it will improve your performance and not the other way around because the, the water would flow from uh, from one place from a uh, from a you know uh, from from one side at uh, I don't know maybe in the middle or somewhere and would come out at the bottom usually with some sort of a buffel or you know so you'd have something. So this is give you um, a conservative ideas because you, you may have something like that. Yeah, the water would flow um, um, and would come out from, from here. Okay, so you'd uh, try, you'd, uh, you'd force your water to do something like that so it have more time and uh, it goes out. So uh, it has more time to, to settle before it goes out. So really if you have um, this way, it's easier for the calculations and stuff, but uh, it gives you a, an idea and not so much the, um, uh, you know, it gives you a, 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 an order of magnitude of your sizing. Yeah, but uh, you can do a better job with just a simple design on your, on your sedimentation. Are they all used in our systems because besides uh, this normal the, rectangle gradients? Yeah. Right, so if you, uh, but it, it's the exact same principle for, for, the, um, yeah, for, for the circular here, for this type of uh, uh, set, settling. And again, the depth is not important here. It's, it's the cross-sectional area and the flow, the, the flux into it. Okay, and you can calculate it. Um, and you just need to know what's the uh, dimension that you need based on the flow that uh, you also know because it's your system, yeah? So uh, you design it uh, by the different uh, other parameters. So if you know that you need uh, three recirculation, you, you have uh, an X cubic meter system and you want three times an hour, then you know what the flow where it will be. So if you know what the, so that's, that's, that's a, a given. If this is a given, based on that, you can calculate the area or, yeah? So, um, so the uh, types of uh, uh, the biofilter size will be based on the number of fish, basically. Number of fish meaning number of feed, means amount of feed, means amount of solids, yeah? Kind of biofilter, but we talked about the sedimentation. Uh, biomass of fish, that's number of fish and biomass of fish is basically, well, it's not the same, but uh, um, it's really the biomass which is important. Uh, because that's the amount of feed and the total volume of water in this uh, system and the flow rate, but it's usually something we can determine. The, the, the various typical um, uh, systems uh, or, or sedimentation tanks that uh, are there are these round settlers, okay, and it's called, um, um, uh, I can't remember whose design it is. Um, it's, it's, it's an American design. Yeah? Swirl separators are usually the ones that are used uh, to, uh, you, you have vortex in the, uh, you add vortex in the system, so you get the, centrif the centrifugal force to uh, help you uh, uh, further uh, in increase the settling velocity of your particles. And the way we do it is just by, um, cutting the, uh, uh, in the pipes, the water flowing instead of from a straight cross-sectional, from, from a twisted, from like that. Instead of from like that, there, you, you cut it like that. So uh, then you have a flow that uh, create circulation in these systems and you can get the vortex going. Yeah, then, um, then we have these drum separators, which is not any more settling, okay, but that's for the more uh, fine particles. And um, yeah, they are costly, but they're good for um, smaller particle sizes often. And then we have the granular media that we for a second talked about, and I'm not gonna elaborate, I'm just gonna show. So you fill it up with um, sand or beads or whatever, and the um, water flows, and then usually we have uh, um, uh, pressure gauge at the top, when that, the pressure increased to a certain uh, concentration, we have to backwash it manually or 
there are devices that are doing it automatically by uh, pressure. So the pressure is up, it opens a valve, you do a backwash, and then it goes and continues to work. Okay? So that's about the solids. So initially, we removed it from the system. Now we have solids. But now what we do with it? The, 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 the thing is that these, um, that these solids have uh, a lot of, uh, uh, a, a, a lot of um, value. 50% of the nutrients is out there, about. Nitrogen, and if you want aquaponic, you know, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus are, are very important. So um, it's, it's in these solids. Normally, it's being wasted. If you can recover this nitrogen and, 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 uh, and phosphorus, it'd be uh, really good because you can extend by four times, I think, or so, three times your, your, the size of your, your, your um, plant material. Yeah? And, um, and also, when you dispose it, you usually have to pay someone. Yeah? If you dispose it, you pay to the wastewater treatment plant or you um, contaminate the environment. It depends when you are, where you are. Um, but that's what happens, so uh, you treat that. And if you can get energy out of that because you can produce biogas, for example, from this thing, then it's even better, but there are other means to uh, produce energy from, from uh, solid waste, okay? Not, not necessarily biogas. Um, and also, it's a carbon source, yeah? So it can be a carbon source for denitrification, like we added sugar today or it can be a carbon source for uh, this anaerobic digestion and you convert it to methane, okay? So um, that's where the solid is so important that it's, it's wasteful to uh, waste it. So you want to keep it and do something with it. And um, what we are gonna do now is talk about its digestion. Uh, the aerobic digestion, I'll just say a couple of words, but uh, mainly we'll, we'll focus today on, on anaerobic digestion. So aerobic digestion is really a bacteria that decompose organic matter. Um, and uh, basically you can measure it, and I uh, on purpose use these um, terms because I, I guess some of you at least are familiar with it, is the biochemical oxygen demand, or OUR is mean oxygen utili utilization rate. The amount of oxygen that bacteria are using uh, can be uh, really converted back into the uh, degradation rate because what they do is they take organic matter yeah, and convert it into with oxygen into CO2 okay, and water. But let's uh, make the, the, the final thing is CO2. So if you measure the amount of oxygen that was consumed, you can go back and oh, it's an indication to the amount of carbon that converted from the organic matter into carbon, okay? So there is, uh, you can measure it as, uh, as um, either, you know, oxygen demand or organic carbon or there are various ways. But oxygen demand is one way to determine the amount of organic matter that you have in your stuff and how much is degraded, yeah, the oxygen utilization. And when organic matter is degraded aerobically, what you need to remember that ultimately it gets to CO2, but there is on the way, as we said, bacteria is not working for free. There is a lot of sludge produced in the, in the uh, way. And then we have to, re to, to, to take care of this sludge. That's why we often do not use aerobic. And also it costs a lot of money because we need to supply oxygen. So that's why we often do not use aerobic digestion onto uh, this type of sludge, specifically when it's very, where, where it's pretty concentrated. You, you want to do it anaerobically. It makes more sense economically. And okay, so um, that's aerobic degradation. And this is just an example for that. And with that, I'll stop with aerobic degradation. So if we had um, uh, glucose in this case, yeah, and we added oxygen, the bacteria will convert it to CO2 and water, that's the final thing. And if we measure how much oxygen was consumed, we can go back and understand how much carbon organic matter we had there. So that's why it's an indication, okay? So that's the, um, 
That's the uh, idea and we can again quantify it and say that's for glucose if you balance this equation anyway you would need um, um, so and so grams uh, of oxygen per one per, 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 per uh, so and so amount of organic matter okay so again it can be quantified and you, you can know how much oxygen you, you would need here that's calculated so we need 0.3 grams of oxygen uh, to, uh, to uh, remove a, a glucose molecule yeah sorry uh, 320 milligram of oxygen to to treat one mole of glucose but that's not one gram of glucose I said one mole sorry um, and um, I, think, I think I'll stop there. That would be enough for aerobic degradation. Now, um, for uh, anaerobic degradation, we'll spend a little bit more time on, on that. And uh, um, so historically, you see it's used for animal and, and domestic uh, wastewater. Uh, really be before I mean 10 years ago it started to uh, to to, um, to rise in aquaculture but it's like dozens of years in, in wastewater treatment and as we said the reason or part of this reason because aquaculturists were not engineers in that regard they, they were growing things in ponds and it's a new field it started only in the 70s um, and also because uh, um, the, the sludge quality is not is not good enough. It's uh, usually the C2N ratio is very high, which is not typical to anaerobic uh, degradation that we were familiar with the with in, in the world of wastewater treatment. Uh, what happens is basically your organic matter is converted into CH4 and CO2. This is typically the ratio. Often it's uh, 15. I think it's in the glucose, we just saw it, it's 50 and 50. Uh, you, know, you cannot, it's uh, aerobic, but um, usually it's anywhere between 50% um, to 70, I mean, 50% methane to 70% methane, that's what we, you would get theoretically in all these reactions. And uh, basically you take, uh, during the digestion, you take organic matter, you convert it to a uh, bacteria, yeah, some growth, and they don't work for free, um, some resistant organic matter, CO2, methane, which is the energy, and then ammonia and sulfides and some heat, okay? When we're looking at the, um, the, uh, what happens there in this anaerobic degradation, they're usually considered, although the bacteria didn't read the book, we usually, um, uh, defined it as four different stages uh, that are done by four different groups of bacteria, okay? So first there is a degradation of the complex organic matter into a simpler organic matter, like monomers and stuff like that. And then, so that's the hydrolysis. And then you have the acidogenesis, uh, which convert the uh, simpler organic matter into volatile fatty acids. Uh, acetone or, or different acids like acetone, butanol, you know, a, a bunch of those. And then uh, some of it is getting directly into hydrogen, ca the, uh, carbon dioxide, fumar formate and, and acetate, yeah, which is, uh, um, which is the, the uh, substrate for the methanogenic group of bacteria, it's not bacteria, it's archaea, that convert these acids into uh, methane. So different, four different steps, okay? And uh, as we said, different uh, bacteria, usually different, uh, um, different groups of bacteria and sometimes different conditions. That's why uh, anaerobic digestion is a bit more tricky. It's harder to, to uh, adjust, to, to create some balance. Uh, digestion is not uh, is not simple and it sometimes can take weeks or months uh, before it goes really well and specifically with uh, fish sludge. So, um, um, uh, uh, 
So what I wanted to say here that often we divide this anaerobic digestion into two stages. So we have one uh, reactor for these first two um, stages, the hydrolysis and acido acidogenesis, and um, we do it in one reactor, yeah? And that's different, one conditions, and then we transfer the water into a second reactor and do the uh, methanogenesis um, all together. Um, not always, but that's something, uh, a direction that is now um, uh, being promoted as well. Now the last bit, you see the methane can get either by group of archaea that can convert hydrogen into methane, so they'll be called uh, uh, hydrogenotrophic methanogens, and if it's uh, acetates, then it will be called acetoclastic methanogens, and you know, and the methyl, uh, the, the methylotrophic methanogen, so they'll convert methyl group into, meth into methane. So there are different group of archaea and different pathways over there, so it's also a bit tricky and something to understand which group of bacteria you want and more adapted, and again, specifically for this fish aquaculture um, sludge. And how, it's not easy to control, but you can direct the uh, digestion towards that in order to, in order to um, uh, make it more efficient. So um, the treatment efficiency, what's the main parameters that are affecting the anaerobic digestion? is the temperature, where we have these three ranges of temperatures, thermophilic, high temperatures, uh, mesophilic and psychophilic, which is the environmental or colder, colder, cooler temperatures. We'll look at it in a second in a, in a figure. We have the reactor design, one or two phase digestion, batch or continuous, whether we load it and let it go and then uh, remove the, the, uh, a batch and introduce another batch or it's a continuous flow. Retention time, so we talked about that in the morning, the hydraulic retention time, the water uh, flow, but also the solid retention time because solids, solids are composed now of the organic matter that we introduce and from the bacteria which are the um, also solids basically, these are bacterial granules. So what is the uh, solid retention time in this? And we already saw or discussed a little bit the solid retention time in the, uh, of uh, how the solid retention time, how the age of the sludge affect its settleability. You remember that we said that if it's an old sludge, then it settles at a different SVI than whether it's a young sludge or, or whether it's a, an, a good operating sludge. So that's another uh, design parameters to consider. And then other things like yeah, the retention time, we talked about the, the moisture content, the how much free ammonia or sulfides we have there, availability of nutrients, and what type of microorganisms we have there, okay? So um, typically, balanced digestion would be um, would be uh, uh, when acetic acid, you remember the substrate for this uh, uh, methano methane would be less than 100 <laughs> or around 100 milligram per liter. Otherwise, if we have too much, it's, it's acid and the pH would drop and the methanogenesis would stop uh, altogether. Fatty acids, less than 50 and uh, low hydrogen partial pressure because again, hydrogen um, uh, and hydrogen sulfides can create redox, uh, uh, can create conditions that are uh, not very, um, um, create acidity and are not uh, good for these methanogens too. They, they have a, a negative feedback. So that's when it's balanced. In balanced digestion, you'd have high hydrogen concentration, you'd have uh, uh, volatile fatty acids like propionate and butyrate, um, and it you see it says pickled or sour waste and long time uh, uh, to repopulate and get to a healthy environment. So once this digester stop working, it's a pain in the neck to put it back to work often. So you either have, um, you either have uh, inoculum 
on the side that you can start, do a starter with, or it's not working very well. Now, inoculum, you don't have to have live bacteria. If you ever, and, and that's something I just, uh, I sent you this, uh, I think I sent you this manuscript, but if you, um, if you analyze your, the diversity in your digester, and you know what group of bacteria you had there, when it worked well, what was the ratio of the different hygienotroph, uh, cetoclastic, methylotrophs, and so on? If you know that, you can take the main groups, you can isolate them, or you can get them from the IPC, or what it is called, ITCC. The, 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 you can get them from, from you know, like the, the, the bacteria from, from the shop, basically. And you can uh, mix them in the right ratio, and then you have uh, an inoculum that works really nicely. And, um, and then your, your time to inoculate your system is shortened from weeks and months to days sometimes. Yeah, and you can look at that. It's really um, interesting and it's working very nicely. And it's again very important with fish sludge that has non-typical conditions specifically in regards to this carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, um, so, so, so it's really helping. pH, you can see that's um, the, the uh, pH that um, methanogenesis yeah, uh, efficiently work. So you can see that at lower pHs, the rate of methane production is low. And uh, at anywhere between, I don't know, six and a half or so, to about seven and a half, it's really operating nicely, but it drops dramatically. Now, for, for uh, hydrolysis, this is not a problem, but for methanogenesis, this is, is, it is a problem. If we look at the, um, um, at, the, um, at the different temperature ranges, so you can see that in the mesophilic area, where the temperature is anywhere between 25 or so to 35 degrees, um, then this group of bacteria that works in, in environmental or warmer, slightly warmer environmental conditions, then, then the, the peak is around 35, 40 degrees. That's where you'd have this peak for methanogenesis. Um, but if you operate in a different group of bacteria, which are thermophilic, then it's around 60, and that's where you have your, your uh, methanogenesis. And you can see how fast, much faster it is than this regime. But this costs money. Yeah, if you want to heat your, your digester to 60 degrees, it, it's obviously uh, money. So you have to, it's a, a trade-off. Yeah? So usually all these aquaponics and aquaculture would work in the mesophilic um, range. And you can see, uh, again, in terms of uh, this is temperature and that's retention time in days. Um, because the thermophilic are so much more efficient, you need smaller, smaller digesters because the hydraulic retention time would be much smaller, you know, like 10, 20 days. We're in the mesophilic range. Uh, people are using 15 days or 18 days all the way to over two months. So these are large reactors. And nowadays, this is old, um, an old book. <laughs> we, 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 we shorten this. We, we show that uh, 12, 15 days would be usually sufficient as retention time. But still, it's a long time, OK, of a uh, long retention time to do this digestion. Um, and it's important to, to uh, be aware of. And it's a, it's a big uh, issue. Now, um, there are different uh, compounds that are interfering with the methanogenesis. So it's not only the environmental conditions, but also the um, the uh, chemicals that are there, or the, the, the chemistry of the water, and in this case, sulfate reduction. Um, you know, sulfate is introducing because it's another electron acceptor before the CO2, so, um, and it produces a little bit more energy, so the bacteria would prefer to oxidize, uh, to, sorry, to reduce sulfate before they go to reduce methane. Not always they read the book, but. Uh, um, but uh, it's true, but you can see that the conditions for sulfate reductions are usually lower temperatures. You see here, it's working well, and then at higher temperatures, it's dropping. Same thing we see here, temperature and, and sulfate reduction growth rate, and it's maximal at around 
10, 15 degrees, and it goes down to the 20s. So uh, it's true for the book. The bacteria really never go, they didn't go to school, but um, as a general term, we, you know, operational conditions, what I want to say, operational conditions can also uh, determine uh, or make your, uh, your, your reactor work better or worse. And um, I think Uri mentioned that in, when, when you all were there, that um, um, uh, the, 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 the usually the, the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the bacteria would prefer the, the process that gains them the most uh, energy. So if you have oxygen, they'll, they'll produce high, um, yeah, the, the, the energy that, that they'll get from it is higher with nitrate lower and with uh, NO2 or manganese oxide in this case lower, sulfate lower and methanogenesis is really the lowest in the chain. So you really need very low redox potential and um, um, everything should be reduced in your, in your, um, in your, in your digestion. Um, nitrogen also affecting the digestion, we talked about that and mainly the carbon to nitrogen ratio, which is typically uh, for 20 to 30 when it's optimal. As we said, fish is around six, eight, nine. I don't know, it depends what you have there, but it's low and, it's, um, and that's why anaerobic digestion of fish sludge it's, is slower and unless you have an adapted uh, community. And this adapted community is something that we can prepare for. In terms of, um, this is the, 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 the slide that we already saw, but now it's, uh, I added the, 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 how it goes from organic matter, lesser, less complex organic matter, you know, to acetate, you remember all these stages, and then methanogens. So uh, now I just put some, uh, well, it's not me, but uh, it's, all, it's uh, added with the uh, percent of, uh, of uh, the, the, you know, a bit more quantitative. So you see that uh, um, the, the, the diversity or the, 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 um, how they develop. So the, this acetate, the pathway for acetate in the methanogenesis is much greater than the pathway of the uh, hydrogenotrophic in uh, wastewater treatment. In, in, uh, in fish, aquacal, I mean, in fish, it's a bit different, but it, it's not done yet, but we can start doing it. Well, I guess that's one of these things that we're currently doing. So what is the, 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 the major pathway uh, in, the, in, in the anaerobic digestion? Um, when you, when, which bacteria are more prominent uh, or prevalent when, when you digest uh, fish sludge? Okay, so that's the... Um, uh, that's the, the, the various pathways. Um, okay. And again, the purpose of all that is to be able to design a, a reactor. So you, you're not going to be engineers or you're not going to, we're not going to, but again, I want to give an example for the concept. The concept is that when we build these reactors, we have to know how to size it. What are the parameters that are important? And in this case, it's the amount of uh, organic matter that we're expecting to get into the digester, yeah? And the amount of water that we're gonna introduce into the, the, the digester per day, this will determine the sizing of it. That's as simple as that. And how we do it, and that's the uh, example here. So it's anaerobic reactor operated at uh, this temperature. Uh, uh, wastewater stream of 3,000 cubic meter per day. That's a large, it's taken from a wastewater stream. And I really need to, to adjust this uh, example. I was lazy. Um, and uh, COD concentration is something we measure, the chemical oxygen demand. Basically, the amount of organic matter in the sample was that. And uh, we know that some of this organic matter is undegradable because it contains maybe lignins that it takes years to degrade, yeah? Or 
something like that. So only 95% of this uh, organic matter will be um, digested, removed. The rest of the five will go out. And as we said, the bacteria are not working for free. So part of this organic matter will be used for, uh, to, to grow bacteria, to, to make new cells. Um, so, um, so uh, and, and, and the rate for the yield of the bacteria, how much they will grow would be 0 0.04 grams. VSS is how we measure the, the volatile suspended solids, how you measure the amount of bacteria. So 0 0.04 grams bacteria out of the uh, COD of the all organic matter. And we would ask how much, and then and the question here in this case is how much uh, methane we are expecting to get from this system. Yeah, if we want to calculate now how much energy we're going to have and if we can operate our system, you know, fully off grid or not. Yeah. So, so these are the uh, question. And uh, in this case, we, uh, we assume here a, a steady state mass balance. That means that uh, whatever gets, you know, that, that, that the system is working um, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a constant mode, basically. Whatever gets, that there are no changes in the system. So uh, there, there are no increase in bio, I mean, there are no, uh, um, changes in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the efficiency of the system, let's say, let's put it this way. And then, the, um, <clears throat> and then we can uh, uh, say that uh, anything that is getting in minus all the organic matter that gets in minus the portion that goes out in the effluent minus the portion that is converted to a biomass would be the, uh, um, the, 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 the bit that will be uh, converted to methane. So this can go here. So the methane concentration or the COD, the organic matter that we converted to methane equals to what organic matter that gets in minus the, um, the, what goes out and minus what converted to cells. Okay, so in another way, the in, equals whatever comes out, the bacteria, and the methane conversion. Okay, and uh, we will not go over the um, example that uh, it's here for you, um, uh, but we, we can really calculate all these, uh, all these uh, bits. I think that's uh, too much for now. Um, but we can, uh, we, we, we can know exactly how much methane or biogas we can get out from these uh, systems. And then we know how much energy we have. And then we know if we, as we said, we can operate these systems. And this is just one example. We'll take a few more minutes and then we'll uh, take a break, okay? So um, this is uh, uh, just um, um, one uh, Let's take a break. <laughs> Let's take five minutes break and then we we'll continue. Let's stop here for a sec. We'll talk a little bit more about just a few examples. I think it'd be uh, easier. Then we'll go to the lab, we'll finish there, and we'll analyze the data here for not too long, I guess. And, uh, and then we'll, uh, that, that's the plan for the day. Um, so this is just one example. Uh, so, so, so there are different types of anaerobic digestion, okay? Uh, that can um, digesters. Uh, so um, and uh, what we started to work with is called the upflow anaerobic sludge blanket or UASB, and. Um, and the reason that we chose this one and not a different one uh, was because it's very well uh, practiced in wastewater treatment. One, uh, so there is a lot of information. The other thing that is very suitable for low uh, solids in the sludge, so uh, relatively, so it's not thick sludge uh, usually, but uh, we have, uh, I guess, one, two, three, four percent uh, solids in, in aquaculture sludge when you, you do the backwash. And, and this device is suitable for this type of uh, uh, sludge. 
uh, where other digesters are working with much higher solid concentration and um, it's, uh, it doesn't uh, require, it's very simple to uh, maintain and operate. Okay, so that's why we uh, basically used it. What it is, it's basically a vessel, you know, like a pipe with a bottom. It has an influent that where the sludge gets in. Um, it, has, uh, it has an effluent or an outlet at the uh, top. It has a, a weir or something that holds um, some sort of a funnel that collect the um, gas. And basically, whenever water gets in, the same amount of water goes out, gas is produced and being collected. So how it works, the sludge gets in, creates here a blanket. In a minute, I'll show an example of that. You have it on your computers. And then what happens is the anaerobic, it's all anaerobic, yeah? Um, and uh, you have to uh, adjust the dimensions of this thing. If anyone wants technical uh, details, I can give some. Uh, but basically, there is a sludge blanket. Bacteria operates, produce CH4, and then these bubbles want to come up. So uh, uh, microbial granules are being formed, and with the gas, they start floating out. As they float out, they do the mixing, and they, then they hit the, the walls and the cap here, and then the bubble is released. The gas, the biogas is collected and can use for energy, and then the granule settles down. Okay, so it goes up and down, up and down, and that's how it works. And the effluent, you know, the, 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 the effluent is pretty clear from, from the, um, from the um, sludge. That's how it will look when it's uh, operating. So you have the blanket, you have, uh, you introduce the, uh, from the uh, side, you introduce the, 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 the sludge, and, uh, and the granules go up and down, and the gas is collected in this, um, you know, the, the, the funnel is inserted into the water and the gas is being collected and you can measure how much gas is produced, you can operate a generator or whatever. Um, in terms of what it does, how we treat the uh, sludge itself, so if we start with a volatile solid, which is representing the organic matter of the untreated sludge, yeah, if that would be 100%, that uh, overall we get something like 50, 40, 60 percent digestion. So we don't, we do not manage to digest all the organic matter in the uh, sludge. Okay, and if we look at organic carbon, um, then you you see basically the same thing. If that's the 100 percent, you get 40 or 60 in this case percent digestion. And in terms of available organic matter, you get almost 100% removal. So the available organic matter is being degraded by the bacteria. This is represented by the BOD. But there is a lot of, of unavailable or undegradable uh, organic matter um, in the, uh, in the um, sludge. And it's undegradable in the period of time that we let the solids stay there. Yeah? Maybe if we let it many more much more time, it would be. And that's how these granules look like, you see? So that's where the blanket is, and the granules go up with, with, the, um, with the bubbles. You can see today in the settling velocity that we did, you'll see that there is a, a floating bit. So you'd see the bacteria are active, and, and this whole sludge blanket is coming up. Look at the, um, at the uh, graduate cylinders that we just put. And then it goes, once it releases the bubble, it goes down again. So it goes up and down, okay? Um, and how it looks in a real system. So uh, this is uh, the, the system we run in the, uh, in the institute. And we have a fish tank, one cubic meter. And this is not aquaponic, just a recirculating system. It has a solid filter here. It has a nitrification reactor. And this is one loop. Whoop. This is one loop, yeah? Um, and as we said, we can grow here up to uh, three, four hundred kilos of fish. And in terms of uh, normal fish, did this we did with catfish, bass, the, you know, sea bream and things like that. We can probably get to about 150, 200 kilos uh, per cube. It's fairly intensive. You can see that the um, feed was uh, given with a feeder. So it was spread over several hours and was not 
uh, introduced in one, uh, in, in, in one load. Nitrification was one loop, denitrification was a second loop, and this, in this case, and I sent you the article, uh, in this case it's an activated, anaerobic activated sludge uh, device, doesn't matter, we're not going to uh, talk about that, but basically the, the, the solid from the backwash is the carbon source for the denitrification. Today we introduced sugar, yeah, so here we introduced sludge. Now, we said bacteria are not working for free, so they produce biomass. In, if you want to have a complete recirculation, then you cannot release this biomass because you release water. So it moved into this UASP, into this anaerobic digester, where everything was, most everything converted to biogas, and the ashes, which was 20% in this case, uh, or something like that, um, um, you have to leave. That's why it's not a fully, exchange, but 99.9, I don't know, 99.5 maybe, um, at these times we operate it. Okay, so that's how this works. So if you have a RAS and now you add another treatment loop, which is these plants, you can have it aquaponics, but the system is working independently. Okay, and that's the approach I think can be there. So you can get the nutrients from the UASB, it's 50% of the nutrients, I don't know if you remember. You can get the uh, nutrients coming from, from the, uh, the other nutrients that are dissolved in the water into your aquaponic bit, okay? But you can get a system that is working independently. So if you have plant problems with diseases or whatever, you just disconnected the two. This working as a hydroponic system and this work as a recirculating aquaculture system. Normally it's operating together, but when you have a problem, you separate the things, okay? And that's how you can maintain water recirculation, energy, and plants, but recover uh, a big chunk of your nutrients. Because the, at the moment, most aquaponics that I'm familiar with, maybe all, are are giving up about 50% of the nutrients. So instead of having, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So that's, um, yeah, how, mm -hmm. that's what I wanted. So that's what I said, how it all goes into aquaponics, okay? So we talked about all day about water quality and water treatment and all that. And now it all goes. So now, uh, that's how we, we, we try to summarize this bit. So um, if, as we said, we have the fish tank, you have the uh, feed and the water, that's the typical aquaponic system. Then you have whatever in the, the, the you have this loop of, <laughs> you have this loop of uh, solid filter and, and biofilter, right? and you have plants, um, if, if it's leaves, then you take it all, if it's tomatoes, then you have dry biomass, you have to treat it, it costs money, uh, you have to waste it, um, and, then, uh, and then you return the water, yeah? And normally the sludge, you just waste it. So now what we suggest is take this sludge, use it, bring it back, On that, and then I'll go to the bring this sludge. Ah, these are the numbers. In a minute, yeah. Bring this sludge back into the system, the, the the effluent, which contain a lot of nutrients. Now you remember that in the anaerobic digestion, all the nutrients is in in terms of nitrogen is in the form of. NH3, ammonia, NH4, doesn't matter, pH dependent. Here we have nitrate, so now we can control the ratio of ammonia to nitrate. We said in the morning that it was uh, something which is important uh, to, to different plants, different ratio. So now we can really have, uh, <laughs> it tells me, yala, go on, move. <laughs> 
So, um, so now we can have uh, uh, more nitrogen, okay? And we can treat the sludge and get the biogas and operate this whole system. So now it's just a matter of calculating, and that's what we try to do all this day, to say that uh, we don't invest, uh, invent anything, but we calculate, then we can calculate how much biomass we need here in order to supply us enough sludge here that will produce enough biogas. We did the calculate, we, we skipped this calculation a few minutes ago, but it, to get us enough biogas to run this whole system of grid. And that's the, um, that's the idea. So you recycle everything, right? You recycle the nutrients, you recycle the solids, so you don't have to treat solids, you just remain with a few grams of ash. You get the uh, energy and you get about three to four times more plant material before you, uh, I mean, on the same amount of fish that you grow than compared to traditional system. And that's the uh, concept we uh, pretty much suggest. Um, and now we put it together. Whether it's going to work or not, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it will. Why it will? Because each part of these components were actually studied. So we know exactly how to operate fish sludge and how much biogas we can get. So the calculation is real <laughs> from fish sludge. We know exactly how this system works and how much we get. And we, I sent you this paper in your notes. Yeah? We know how much nutrients there is in the UASB. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. All the energy. The system runs off-grid completely and not dependent on solar energy or anything like that, just on its own. Is there an equation between kilo freedom to kilowatt? Exactly. Yes, 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 yes. yes. That's exactly right. Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah, because you remember it. Yeah, because you remember that they actually absorb only 80%, uh, I'm sorry, only 20% of the carbon. Yeah. So 80% of what you give is wasted. So obviously you cannot recover all this 80%, but if you can recover 60% of this 80%, 80% of this 80%, then you're good. Then you have energy that normally is wasted, and here it's coming back to your, to your energy. So the form of carbon is always organic matter because fish excretion is organic matter. Right. So, so, but we know that because I just showed here and that's in your notes. And I'll get back. Mm -hmm. Here, I know what fish sludge is, and I know how much energy is stored in fish sludge. Yeah? So it's not a guess anymore. I know how much, if I'm saying one gram of fish sludge, I can tell you one gram of fish sludge will be converted to so-and-so kilowatt. Okay? I know, I don't know, I don't remember. <laughs> Uri knows, maybe. Um, but we know. Um, <laughs> When, when you introduce one kilo of feed, how much fish sludge you end up here. So, you, you know, if you uh, give enough feed, then you'd have enough energy. Unless when you size it up, and that's because, you know, the efficiency as well, right? Because when you size it up, energetically it becomes more efficient. So there is an optimum there where it crosses. And it's a decentralized system can be, you know. Um, it's still, uh, we will calculate, it's around a ton of fish or something like that. Uh, I don't know if I showed it or not. Okay, so this is the typical uh, system. This is, we saw this graph in the, that was the first slide of today. It's just in a different form. You remember the Aniton feed, 
the, what's coming as feces, what's coming as fish excretion through the gills, and, and so on. So that's the same for carbon, for nitrogen. We, you can measure all these things. Yeah, and, um, um, and this is, um, and this is a, a typical aqua, aquaponic system. So if you'd grow 1,000 kilos of fish, sorry, you'd end up with uh, about anywhere about three, <laughs> three to 700 square meter of plants, yeah? With a typical FCR of that, and you'd get so-and-so production. If you run it with this UASB thing, you can increase that by three-folds, at least theoretically, because you'd have three, you'd have enough nitrogen and, and nutrients out there. And you'd get this energy, as we just said, okay? Um, and these are just for you again, I will not uh, go, but we were talking about that again and again. What, well, that the fate of feed in these systems, okay? So if you have 100% feed, and uh, so 25% would remain in the fish, and you'd end up with only 25, <laughs> you'd end up with only 25% um, in the plants today. If you'd get that in, you'd end up with uh, much more or a larger size uh, in plant area. And again, you can control the NO3 to NH4 ratio and make it way more efficient, um, your growth. Yeah, in the plant area, no, the like plant the source of carbon, yeah. especially with tomatoes. Yeah, have... exactly. You have the, 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 the plant itself yeah. because you take only the fruits. Okay, and remember that plants are, yeah, uh, a big source of uh, energy as well because they take carbon dioxide um, and not organic carbon and make it as a, to, to sugars and carbon. Okay, so this is the calculations of the, the, the sizes. It's not important, I think, um, here. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in theory, we, we got that it can be six times more. We can get... Uh, for a for thousand kilos, you can get uh, up to four, four dunams or 4,000 square meter uh, tomato beds versus the typical, uh, to, typically today 700, and then, then you can get uh, 200 and kilos tomato per day versus 60 uh, kilo per day in current practice. So these are the differences, it's dramatic. And if it can run off grid, then it can be even much nicer. So um, 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 if to uh, conclude, in this case, then the integration of this reactor, anaerobic digester, in this case, we suggest UASB, but I mean, it can be anything, I guess. Uh, uh, biogas production can enable off-grid. Thank you. <laughs> but it means that we are there. <laughs> <laughs>